Good morning everybody and welcome to your live and private African safari. I am sitting in the Masai Mara National Reserve. First thing as the sun has broken through the clouds with a pride of lions known as the Ololos. And there are lots of little cubs who are showing some keen interest in a few birds that are fluttering around this morning. It is absolutely spectacular out here today. A gentle breeze and everybody seems to have had a very, very busy night last night doing what I'm not sure. But hopefully as the day goes on, we'll be able to find out what they got up to if they hunted but it is very, very stunning out here today. Now, for those of you that have just jumped on board again, a big welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is Taylor, and like I said, this is live, and this is happening right now. And we have got another location down in South Africa in the Sabi Sand, which is leopard country. And so hopefully you'll have an opportunity today uh, to be able to see not just the lions but also some big cats down in South Africa you could see cheetah you could see of course leopards that's what it's known for and lions are most certainly on the cards too now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stay here with these cats and hopefully they'll wake up from their sleep but for now I'm going to send you thousands and thousands of miles across the country down to South Africa, where you're about to meet your host for the day, Mr. James Hendry. Good morning and welcome to this very special Big Cat Week rehearsal of Safari Live. My name is James Hendry and I'm talking to you under fairly leaden skies but great slices of golden sunshine are coming through on us. It's about 70 degrees Fahrenheit or so. It is another inspirational African morning. We're coming to you live from the Sabi Sands in South Africa and of course the Masai Mara in Kenya where you and I are going to be scouring the landscape for the iconic big cats of Africa during the next two hours. The lion, the leopard and of course the cheetah. Now it's all completely live and interactive. We'd love to hear from you. You can use the hashtag Safari Live to get hold of us and well the first thing I'd like to know from you is, yes, the following. There are eight big cat species in the world. Three of them occur in Africa. Which of the eight are, is your favorite? So that's using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. You can tell us which of the world's eight big cats is your favorite. Now, you've already met the Ololo pride, a very sort of iconic pride of the Masai Mara. We're hoping to introduce you to a very special leopard right now, an 11-year-old leopardess who has just given birth to a tiny little cub. Go and have a look. Indeed we do. We've got the very elusive and very shy Tandi and she is slowly but surely carving her way through the thickets as she goes about her morning business. And this is so exciting because I think she's been on her nightly patrol. She looks very, as though she may be heading with, back towards the den and maybe we'll be able to introduce you all to this tiny little fluff ball that we saw a few weeks ago. My name is Tristan and this is going to be the most exciting morning because we're going to follow her as much as we can through all of these thickets remember this is live it is interactive so i would love to know from you guys what you think is she going to the den or do you think that she is going to be hunting and you can do that hashtag safari live on twitter right now we're going to try keep up with her it is incredibly thick where she's walking at the moment she's heading in the right direction to go towards the den but she keeps stopping and stalking and using her tail to indicate that she's interested in something and so i wonder if maybe she's going to take us on a hunt as well. Anyway, it's going to be very exciting and so while we watch her creep through these thickets, let's go to my friend Steph who's in the wilderness on foot and see what he's got with him. Well, I must be honest, I'm also creeping through the thickets over here today and a very good morning to you. It's uh, Steph and Winterboer and uh, we have got an elephant in the bush right here with us. Come and have a look a little bit closer. It's, a very, it's actually quite a difficult sighting this because the bush is very thick but it doesn't offer a lot of elevation. 
Now, elevation is key to staying safe with the elephant. I see he's actually moved off. Come, let's move into the open air. Come. So elevation is key to staying safe as is wind direction. Now, not forgetting that this is live, so you and I are approaching this elephant together for the first time. He's listening to us. You can see his ear through there. It's going to be a little bit difficult with a thick bush, but he knows that we're here. He's just heard us now. So, there you can see the ears are up. Just making sure that we're not going to be posing a threat. We're going to give him the benefit of the doubt and just stay safe and see if we can get into a better vantage point for you. In the meantime, why don't you go over to that leopard that's with Noel? Exciting as this, everybody. We have the young prince. We've got Hasana just here on the other side of Chitwa Chitwa Dam. This is super exciting because where we are, there's some bush buck that are near here. Look, he's gone into stalking mode. Remember, we are live. We're live from the Sabi Sands in Juma Game Reserve in South Africa. Now, it's interesting because he circled around, but he didn't see this bush buck and the little one. Good morning. I am Noel, and I'm going to do my best to follow this little male as we go through. It's a little bit of a, a, a thick, hectic area, but we're going to do our best that we possibly can. All right, now where I need to move to, oh, there's some elephants that are here as well. I'm going to try and get us views of everything. It's going to be a little bit difficult, but let's see. Let's see what we can do. So he's moving just through here. Sense, do you think we can get a view through there? Okay, Sense says it's it's a little bit hard. I'm gonna do my best. I'm sorry for the back of my head, but just just bear. Ooh, there's a stump. <laughs> just bear with me for now. I'm gonna have to squeeze past this bush. We've got a beautiful herd of elephants just in front as well. So I'm actually going to have to just stop here for a minute. We'll have a look at these Ellie's because they can smell that this leopard's here. So I don't want to bother the Ellie's too much. I want them to move across and then we'll get a um, view of, of that, that leopard again as best as we possibly can. It's very thick in here as you can see. <clears throat> I'm going to have to do a little bit of a little bit of work here. I think I'm, we're going to have to go back and get past this bush and not get stuck in the bush and then see if we can get around. It's going to be a little bit tricky but we're definitely going to do the best that we can. Now I haven't seen Hasana in about two or three weeks so that that was very good and just before you came to me we lost sight of him so I did a little Ooh, see, did you hear that? The elephants have found Hasana. Let me just stop for a minute. They found Hasana, okay? Listen, listen, listen. So he's gonna change direction now. Now that these alleys are going and doing this, he's gonna change direction. So just behind this thick bush, just where I am, is where they're busy watching him. Now it's in. They're chasing him. I can hear them chasing him. Now it's interesting because usually they don't do much with leopard, but I think this leopard surprised them. And then they can hear my vehicle as well. So it's a little bit of a tricky situation. I'm gonna come around and move around as best as I can and we're gonna try and refind this little leopard. How exciting, how exciting is this? Now we've talked about this before, how exciting um, predator interaction is. And we had amazing interactions with the wild dogs and the hyena yesterday. And then today we're having predator prey interactions, which again is absolutely fa fascinating. So again, sorry for the back of my head. Just want to meander through. I don't want to hurt Wendy again like I did the other day while we were chasing the wild dogs around. Super exciting. Okay, now while I'm busy trying to get us another sighting of this leopard, let's head on up to the Maasai Mara, which is about 1,600 miles far north and east of us, to Taylor, who has some amazing lions that she would like to show you. Well, good luck, Noel, because I know that after the rain, 
Well, the sabi sand vegetation can be quite difficult to navigate through and provides perfect camouflage for leopards and, well, also for lions. But out here in the Mara, it's slightly different. It's more grassland than anything. It's open. There's a couple of trees dotted about. And the Ololola Pride have actually chosen a very good spot to lounge about this morning because the clouds are going to burn away and they're going to need some shade to sleep under. Now, a great question from Ray Flower about whether lion cubs will bring back birds uh, to the adults like sort of house cats do. Well, uh, very interesting enough. Not necessarily. But unfortunately, these little ones will be quite clumsy still, but they do take interest in any birds fluttering around. They're prick their heads up, they'll try and stalk and of course this is all very important for one day when they're big and strong like the adults when they have to hunt buffalo. But they practice on the moves. Birds don't really get the adults too excited. As you can imagine they're wanting uh, to well catch bigger and better things. Now I'm going to send you all the way across to my friend Tristan who is driving around in the northeastern corner of South Africa and he's got one of my favorite spotted cats. We do indeed Taylor and it is so difficult to keep up with her at the moment. She's in really thick bush but this is exactly where leopards like to be. Leopards like to get into these thickets where that spotted coat can just help them melt away and disappear when they're starting to hunt and you can see as she moves away from us through this thicket how those spots break up her outline and she camouflages so incredibly well. Now I'm going to try and keep up with her because she is going to give us a slip if I don't stay with her. She is moving through horribly thick stuff at the moment Moment. but like I say this is exactly where she wants to be and what she's doing at the moment is she's moving around and she's going back and forth and back and forth and she's trying to flush smaller animals so she's trying to flush things like baby impalas that have just been born during this lambing season she's also been trying to flush little scrub hares which is a type of kind of rabbit that we get here in this area as well as things called diker which is a small antelope so that's what she's trying to do is she's trying to go and weave herself through these thickets enabling her to try and flush these out and as they run out she can then give chase now I've lost her for the time being oh there she is she's going to be straight ahead of us there is a very steep ditch here that I've got to try and get through so while I try and negotiate this ditch I believe Noel's pachyderms have started to quench their thirst my pachyderms have started to quench their thirst. We have a beautiful breeding herd of elephants that are busy behind Chitwa Dam Wall. Now this is where Hasana started meandering through. We heard all of those elephant uh, trumpets earlier, really amazing sounds. I would say there's about 20 or 30 elephants here breeding herd mixed with some males. Now the trouble with this is that we've had enough rain so our usual little hidey spot that we meander through. Anyone that watches the show regularly will remember the scene that we had about six weeks ago, five weeks ago, where Hasana was trying to get that baby hippo. That's just behind me and in front is where we normally drive. But unfortunately with all this rain our normal little driving spot has turned very wet. So myself and another vehicle from Chitwa Chitwa Lodge are busy trying to see if we can find Hasana again. So what I'm doing here is I'm just watching. I'm watching these elephants to see if Hasana is maybe just ducked down and hidden and the other vehicle is busy moving around to the other side to see if he pops out there. Now while I'm busy trying to find this beautiful male leopard with this stunning vision of elephants as a detour, let's head on up to the Maasai Mara where Brent has a huge cat that is having a morning meal. Look at Look at this, the Paradise Pride are on a zebra kill. We've arrived here just too late. They crossed early this morning and I can tell that by the footprints in the mud next to me. And the Paradise Pride's perfect hunting strategy can use to pay dividends. And you can see all the crocodiles in the river. They are waiting for the next herd of zebra to try and cross here. My name is Brent Deersmith and we are 100% live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya, 1,600 miles away from where you've been seeing all those leopards in South Africa. And we're in big cat country. Now, these lions 
This pride in particular specializes in catching animals just after they cross the river. That's the spot where the tired animals who've just evaded the crocodiles leap up that little bank and the lions are often there in waiting. I think we must have missed it by about 20 minutes, half an hour this morning while we were on our way. Now they are a big pride. This is not all of them. They are often spread out along the thickets along the river and uh, waiting for the different animals to try cross. Indiana James, did someone say cat a day? Yes, it indeed it is Saturday, cat a day. And remember, if you have any questions or comments, hashtag Safari Live is the best way to get hold of us. And even with the river, I can just hear the grumbling growls of the lions as they argue over the scraps of the zebra. It doesn't look like a particularly big one. Now, there's always the possibility that if the crocodiles get hungry enough, they're going to try to come out of the water and uh, steal what's left of that carcass from the lion. So I'm not going to move a muscle. I'm going to sit right here. And while we keep looking at the macro, it seems like James has got both macro and micro to show you. I do have macro and micro. We've got an elephant just behind us and that's not what I wanted to show you but I think I will show you anyway we were just sitting quietly on the ground here looking at this plant it is a lion's eye it is of course going to be big cat week so we're big cat week focused at the moment this is a lion's eye flower which we're hoping is going to open up during the course of the show as we put the Sun on it I planted it in this pot yesterday and I'll just show you the color because it's very beautiful under the microscope if I can get it there oopsie come on there uh, no no yes there we are gorgeous we got that under the microscope there and that color of course will never be seen by a lion that beautiful orange color will never be seen by a lion because unfortunately a lion is entirely colorblind and so while that is a beautiful orange color the lion is largely seeing in greens and reds shades of green and red only look at this magnificent sight coming now there are at least 15 elephants coming down to the water to drink oh wow we're not going to move from here I'm just going to sit exactly where I am as soon as I stand up and reveal my sort of human form standing up they will almost certainly react negatively now while we watch these beautiful elephants coming down we may have to get up quickly and jump into the car but we're not going to just yet we've got an answer from Indiana James and Pug Lover they wanted to see Cheetah today well you might be lucky Carla and Erlene you were hoping for Leopard Jeremy wants a Black Panther well Jeremy it would be wonderful to see a Black Panther and for those of you who are wondering what a Black Panther is of course it's a melanistic form of Leopard or Jaguar they would be called Black Panthers and then Pensive wants to see a tiger. And Pensive, oh sorry, right, of course, I told you that you were to tell me your favourite cat of the eight. That's right. Pensive, tiger is your favourite. I can show you a model of a tiger if you like. And uh, Jeremy, well, the Black Panther I also uh, particularly am fond of and would love to see. Sorry, I'm just slightly distracted by the fact that there are 20 elephants heading straight for us and I am not in a position to extract myself at great speed should they arrive. Is this not special? Ginger, you say this doesn't seem safe for me. It's, it's okay, because they've, we've been here for a while, sitting right out in the open, so they know that we're here, it's not like we've surprised them or they've come round a bush and suddenly there we were. They can see the vehicle that we came on. They can see Fergus, the cameraman, sitting on the ground next to me. And so we should be okay. 
Matthew, you're wondering about aggression to humans and if these elephants are aggressive to human beings. No, they're not. They are threatened by human beings. Now, there are a lot of times that people will refer to animals like elephants as aggressive. And for me, that is the wrong term to use. They are not aggressive. They are easily threatened. We as human beings are dangerous to animals. They know that from eons of evolution with us. And that means that they will respond in the same way that any kind of threatened animal will respond. Either by running away, or if they don't feel they can do that, by trying to remove the threat. In other words, by attacking. They still keep coming from around the corner. And I will tell you that at the very early this morning, just before we came to see you live, Hosanna, that leopard who you just saw with Noel, was sitting right here on this wall looking at us. He watched us set everything up and then he disappeared over the back of the dam. Is this not very special? They're all going to have a little drink now. And I can hear them calling. And I'm just going to shifty my backside around a bit so that should the need arise I can jump into the car quickly. I don't think they're going to be threatened by us here. They should be fine. Fergus, if I say now, that means you leave the camera and move. This is absolutely astounding. Right, we're going to go away for a short break. I'm going to sit right here with these elephants. Please don't go anywhere. This is Safari Live. Okay, right, well, everybody on the fake internet brag, here we find ourselves. Uh, slightly heart raised, uh, heart uh, rate raised, unable to speak, sitting on the ground not very far from. Uh, there are even more coming now. This is a massive herd of elephants. What we're going to do is just unplug this microscope because if we need to move it, we're going to have to go quite quickly. I don't want to leave my lion's eye in its pot. <laughs> Everything seems to be very calm at the moment. Sebastian, are you ready to get on the car, if I say, and drive? No, 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 just, you might need to jump on quickly. Michael, you want to know if they know I'm here? Absolutely they know I'm here. Just, I think, just sit on the car in case we have to leave quickly. Michael, some of them are watching me, the ones to the left are watching me, and there are a whole lot more bigger ones now coming through, big pregnant female coming through behind me, they definitely know we're here, Michael. And the young bulls and young cows looking slightly more interested. Alright, T, if that car comes the other side of that bush, alright, let's move in the car. Now, unfortunately, we've lost a sign of Tandy, and so while James has a few technical difficulties, we're having a few difficulties keeping up with her. So she really is moving through some thick, thick vegetation, and I'm trying everything I can to keep up with her, but it is really difficult in here. It's got a lot of dense trees that are difficult to negotiate, and somebody who's not really having too much of a difficult time in negotiating and finding his individual is Brent Leo. Smith and let's go and see him and what those lines are up to on the Mara River. Nope, I'm sitting next to the river listening to the lovely call of the birds and as well as the growling of the lions as that carcass gets less and less. And you can see one of the adult females. Uh, she's a very distinct female. If you can have a look, she's the one sitting up on the right. Um, she's missing most of her right hand. Yeah, I've seen her quite a few times before. Here we go, there she is. You can see she's missing her ear on the right side. 
Now, there is another pro uh, female in the Paradise Pride who is missing an eye. Now, of course, holding the best territory in the Mara takes a bit of fighting to keep it. I'm always keeping an eye out to see if any of the scavengers have heard the commotion of the lions fighting over the carcass and have come to investigate. But so far, not yet. Oh, I take it back. Look at wrong side of the river, but we have one of the scavengers who has heard the commotion. But unfortunately for that little chap, we have to brave the crocodiles to get there. Welcome back live to the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Now look at this, some of the lions have eaten their full already. Look at that little young male, his belly is obese. Oh, the others are still fighting for the scraps that are left of that zebra. And uh, there's a big female keeping guard. Now she's a very distinctive female with one ear. There you, go, you can see that there. Now remember, this is 100% live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya. And uh, remember the hashtag Safari Live. If you have any questions for us, isn't this exciting? We're with the Paradise Pride. And while they fight over a carcass like that, it's, it's not uncommon for their growls to be heard far and wide by other predators such as hyenas or jackals or the dominant male lions from this area. So there could be a male lion coming in to take his share of the meal uh, if they don't finish it fast enough. But that's how it works out here. There's such competition over everything. Now, just below the lions, right up against the bank, there are some of the Mara River behemoths. There we go. And Lady Starfire is wondering, will the lions fight the crocodile or will they simply just run away? Now, that all depends on how hungry they are. I have seen this pride fight with crocodiles before, not very far from here. So, yes, sometimes they will fight the crocodiles. Now, the crocodiles are masters of the water. However, they can be a little bit cumbersome on land, which gives the lions a bit of a sort of, oh, there's a bit of growling. A, a bit of a, an, an, well, an agile, they're much more agile than the crocs on the ground. So it gives them a little bit of advantage outside of the water. But a big male croc weighing in at 800 kilograms, uh, so more than three or four times the size of an adult lioness, um, can be quite a daunting prospect with those massive jaws. But yes, they do fight with the crocodiles um, over the carcasses. Now, it seems that some of you are a little bit worried that 1,600 miles from here, uh, my good friend James was in a bit of danger with elephants, but he's got lots of experience and knows exactly what he's doing, so I'm sure he's quite safe in just enjoying the experience of having elephants on foot. Well, we've got back into the car. Here we are, with two young bulls going past the car now. <laughs> We had a remarkable experience with all of these elephants. They came very close and so we just thought rather than threaten them, let's get back into the car. And what there is here is a young bull causing trouble. And he's chasing the females and one or two of the other bulls around. And the reason that he will be tossed out of the herd is because he is causing trouble with the youngsters. He'll bully them, he'll irritate the cows and they will eventually thrash him until he leaves. 
Now the protective nature of how they're behaving now, corralling the little ones, has got to do with us, but it's exactly how they will behave around lions. And interestingly, they behaved in that typically defensive fashion even around little Hosanna, a two-year-old male leopard who has absolutely no chance of causing any harm at all to any elephant. And yet, they behaved in this extremely defensive manner to the little leopard. So really, these elephants don't like the predators. They don't like the big cats at all. And I suppose, while it might be valid with big prides of lions in very dry areas, sometimes elephants are killed by lions, uh, out here it's extremely unusual, it's extremely unusual in the Maasai Mara of course and so it must be some kind of sort of throwback to their evolutionary past. Now look at them running here, they're running away not from us but from this cheeky bull over here to our right hand side. There, those cheeky chaps there and the cows are just corralling the youngsters. This is now a very young group there's the matriarch there. See how she's turned with the little calf? She's the matriarch of the small group and we saw them the other day. And it's unusual to find a young elephant like that leading a herd. She's only about, I'd say, 20 to 25 years old. She's not very big. And she is the leader of this little group. There were two or three little groups of elephants that came in here, all of them independent from each other. They will sometimes join up. But it's up to that young cow with the recurved tusk to lead this magnificent herd. I'm missing comms here. There they go. Uh -uh. What was the question? <laughs> ah, now from Chitty Chatty Meg, I think, what is a pachyderm? A pachyderm is something with wrinkly skin, as far as I remember. And so we use the term to describe both elephants and rhino. Pachyderm, I think, means loose or wrinkly skin. From derm, skin. Pachy obviously means loose or wrinkled. I forget which exactly. What a magnificent sighting we've had here. Right, well, Big Cat Week, of course, will be the site of many murders, and Scott has just found one of those. We certainly have, and my name's Scott. I'm teamed up with Herbie, an expert tracker who's helping with an extra set of eyes and ears to keep us safe as we search the bush for any sign of more big cats. But before we found any big cats, we found a crime scene that I'm pretty certain some lions were responsible for. You can see a lot of big bones here, and these are the bones of a Cape buffalo. So I'm almost certain that it was the biggest of the big cats, the lion, that managed to bring this buffalo down. You can see the bones are very clean. It's not a fresh kill, but certainly a crime scene nonetheless. It sounds like you guys have got off to a great start on this morning's safari, and let's hope that our luck continues for Big Cat Week next week. Now what I'm hoping on showing you, here it is, there's another predator using this crime scene as a launch pad for its own hunting. And it's called a rubber fly. It's one of the insect world's most effective aerial hunters. And they can be quite docile, so I'm going to... Oh, I took a risk. Didn't pay off. It's just flown and landed on this big rib bone over here. And this is called a rubber fly. And what they'll do is they'll keep themselves perched on a spot like this, wait for any little insects to fly past, and they fly up, tackle them in the sky, land on the ground, and then start feeding on them. So, interesting how another little predator is using the remains of this lion kill as its launch pad for hunting. Now, we're going to keep moving. We're hoping to find some more tracks and signs of big cats in this area. So we'll be sure to keep you updated if we do get any luck. But thankfully, you guys can head straight back up to the Maasai Mara now with Taylor and her lion pride.
We're well, still with the Ololo Pride live here in the Masai Mara National Reserve with two very, very sweet cubs that have decided to just cuddle up to one another. It was very rainy yesterday, cold, lots of lightning and thunder. So I'm sure that these tiny tots are a little bit on the chilly side. So to keep warm, they will snuggle up to each other as well as mom or any of the other lionesses in the pride and it seems that they're quite dirty as well and I don't blame them because we've been slipping and sliding around out here uh, in all the mud and I think those little cats have been doing exactly the same thing but how great is that? Now, for those of you who have only just hopped on the largest safari vehicle in the world, my name is Taylor McCurdy. And remember, you can chat with us today. You can ask us any question you like. Hashtag Safari Live. That is the way to get hold of us. Because remember, this is live and it's happening right now. And you are in Kenya at the moment, which is pretty spectacular. Now... A fantastic question from Zach this morning as we have a look at these lovely lions on the termite mound. You're wondering whether there's any behavior that you can see uh, when when you're a little bit too close to lions or when they're unhappy with you. Most certainly, uh, so typical telltale signs is like a cat would at home when it's unhappy with you, will put its ears flat back against its body and also start to show their teeth. And if they're really upset, they'll start to growl and snarl. And, and it's pretty easy to pick up. So most things that a house cat would do, and when they start swishing that tail, you know that you've crossed the line. So it is very, very important to watch these cats. But as you can see, they're not perturbed by us at all this morning. They're quite happy to just rest up uh, out in the open in fact and we're not very far away from them either they're just laying off into the distance now, I went around a little bit earlier and I snuck on the other side of the drainage line because I heard some contact calls of lions I know that there are only three lioness and four young cubs in this pride so it must be the big boys there are three big males that have been hanging around here known as the Kichwa Temba males and I really hope that we get a chance to see them but Perhaps all that uh, sounds we were hearing is them waking up. Now, Rishi, another fantastic question this morning. Uh, you're wondering how old are the cubs when they start to go hunting? Well, these little ones are a bit on the young side. They're between five and six months or so, so they're not going to be hunting anytime soon. They might be observing and being a bit cheeky and ruining the hunts for the adults, but typically at about a year and a half, they'll start to move off with the females and start observing. Isn't that absolutely sweet? Completely drenched. That just melts my heart when you see young cubs like that. And they did catch a warthog too. We found a warthog carcass down in the drainage line, so we know that they've had a meal. So good job to the lionesses because hunting can be a particularly tricky thing for those girls and they do have of course a priority to feed these young cubs so there's a lot of pressure on their shoulders and not being the most successful hunters out of the big cats it can be a bit tough but Luckily, food is plentiful at the moment. Lots of warthogs around, which is what they're mainly feeding on. Uh, lots of topi and Thompson's gazelle and the odd buffalo here and there. Now, speaking about African buffalo, I know that there are plenty down in South Africa in the Sabi sand. And that's an animal that Steph is going to have to look out for while he's on bushwalk. I'm hoping that my bald head looks the same as what the top of a buffalo skull looks like and, uh, and therefore can, you know, there's a sense of connection there. Now, you know, when we're looking for the great cats and the big cats of Africa, one of the best places to look for them is in thickets like this. And the reason for that is that cats, like, like most things really, lie up during the heat of the day, with the exception, I suppose, of, uh, of a leopard or two that I know of, which really enjoys walking around in the hot sun. But these thickets, this is a Tambwiti thicket, and these thickets traditionally have very little grass cover underneath them and provide a very dense shade. Top of that, they will be, they will be used over and over again. And 
quite often you'll find that if there's no tracks in an area but you've heard lions or you've heard animals making alarm calls these are the places that we come and have a look at and right now last night there were two leopard that were walking in this direction and this is why we've come to look in this particular place we wanted to see if those leopard had come into this thicket and you were using one of these trees here as a marking post and uh, and hopefully um, we'll pick up some or other type of sign of their passing and their passage and get onto their trail as soon as we can. All right, we are going to be going all the way back to Kenya again because Brent is sitting with those lions on that zebra kill and uh, want to go and see what they're doing. Well, isn't it amazing we traveled all the way from South Africa to the Mara in a split second? And uh, we're still sitting with the Paradise Pride. And there's almost absolutely nothing left of this zebra carcass. And uh, oh, I'm, I'm so disappointed we just missed it. But, however, you never know what can happen next live. Because the zebras feel the need to cross the river. And if the lions just move off a little bit and snooze in the thickets right next to them, Another zebra might inadvertently make the mistake of crossing here. Now, Helen is wondering, are there still animals migrating? Helen, no. And yes. <laughs> um, so the big migration of, of thousands of animals uh, is not going on. But there are constant small local migrations of animals. So the zebras are moving around. The zebras that are resident in the Mara are moving around. Uh, constantly depending on where the rain is where the best grass is so there's a constant movement of animals even the topi the thompson's gazelle all depending on the grasses and what's happening but it sounds like we're having a lion filled morning in the mara but a thousand six hundred miles away in possibly one of the best known leopard areas in the world we have got the third leopard of the morning All right, everyone, sleeping in the grass here, we have Tingana, my nemesis leopard. He is fast, fast, fast asleep. Shame, Hasana, where we saw Hasana earlier, he managed to escape us because of those elephants and he moved over into Little Gowrie, so unfortunately we couldn't follow him. Uh, but we managed to come out of that area and here is Tingana. It's super, super, super exciting because normally when we're looking for him, he escapes and then every time we want to put him on camera, it just, <laughs> it just never works. So um, unfortunately, uh, or sorry, I should say fortunately for this morning, we have a nice view of him now it's a little bit tricky because he's on the northern side of where we are allowed to drive so we have a nice view of him right here and now but if he moves more to his right hand side it'll be difficult Zach, I'm having a little bit of a breakup um, from my control room, but I think it sounds as if you're asking, do lion and leopards get along? Now, Zach, no, they don't. They actually really dislike each other. Um, they, they will fight. They will try and kill each other. They'll try and kill each other's cubs. It's really um, not a nice relationship. They, they don't enjoy each other's company. And that has to do a lot with the food sources that they eat or go for. Not that a big leopard is going to necessarily go for a large buffalo like a lion will but it's still another predator and still technically something that should be not just avoided but ousted and and pushed off now it's interesting when lion and leopard do scent marking they're not scent marking for another species they're scent marking for their own species but you will see lion and or leopard picking up the smells of say it's a leopard that's walking around smelling picking up the scent of the lion and then uh, deciding whether or not it wants to carry on with its course and and trying to figure out how how fresh that is now I want you to notice how curled up he is and I want you to notice uh, just how well he blends in so when we were looking for Hasana earlier I had to get out and walk around managed to find him got in the vehicle and then he came past but then with all of that elephant activity it was very difficult to refine him and drive through these thick areas now we just have another vehicle that's coming through and I just need to move very quickly just so they can get past 
excitingly enough, there are some male lions that are over on Encoro, which is behind us. It is not somewhere where we can normally go, so we're just going to wait for them to move a bit more to the east, and then hopefully we will be able to get a view of them, which would be absolutely fantastic. I'm just excited that this little guy decided to curl up in his nook where we can actually see him. And I say little guy, he's much bigger than Hasana. He's probably about twice Hasana's size and um, and much older. Hasana is not territorial, but um, Tingana is definitely territorial. And Hasana is really giving him a run for the money when it comes to who's going to be able to take care of of this territory here. Um, now, when it comes to the male leopards and moving around in in their their areas, when a male leopard like Tingana starts to get older, young male leopards like Hasana, who normally would be pushed off and away and out of an area completely, can kind of tell that he's a little bit older and tend to stick more close by. Um, but while we're busy waffling away about leopards, which you know I love, Scott has something amazing on bushwalk, so let's head on over to him. Well, potentially something amazing. We're approaching a waterhole, and before we arrived here, there's some birds called lapwings. Here's one up ahead of us. Chip, 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 chip. And they're alarmed about something. And we're going to continue on and poke our head around the corner here. The waterhole's just here. We're hoping there's going to be another big cat to add to the list of many lion and leopard that you've already seen this morning. I'm hoping there's going to be a big cat here lying on the damn wall. Who knows? We have to send you off on a quick break, though. Make sure you're here to check what happens. This is Safari Live. Wild Dog! Can you believe it? It's an injured wild dog. Shame. You can see its back right leg is broken. And we've noticed there's the bird bomb diving it. That's exactly what got our attention. Unfortunate timing for those who had to go for the ad break, but I'm glad some of you didn't and got to enjoy that with us. Now, we don't want to put any pressure on this wild dog. Um, it is injured, as you can see, and there has been a pack moving through this general area over the last couple of days. So hopefully it'll be able to relocate with them, but you can see it certainly was not in a good state. Well, we're going to leave it be. I'm so happy we got to add another predator to the list, but now we're going to send you across to Ronald the Rover, who's getting close to some elephants. I'm not hearing anything like this. Right, hello everybody. I'm not sure if we're in an advert break. My radio communications, absolute disaster this morning. Beautiful elephant there. And we've just had a magnificent shot of him with Ronald the Rover. And he's a young bull who's hanging off the rest of that herd. Quite vulnerable as he is on his own now. But he's big enough to escape the attentions, probably, of even the largest pride of lions in this area, the Unkuhuma pride, to whom we shall hopefully introduce you at some stage during Big Cat Week, which is next week, of course. And just amazing to have had three leopards today. Unbelievable stuff. Now a wild dog. All of them turning up to try and be with us during this Big Cat Week rehearsal. We're going to sit here probably until this young bull moves off. And what he's doing... I can hear comms, but I can't hear anything. Live monkey, do they react to vehicles? Live monkey, do they react to vehicles? Yes, live monkey, they do indeed react to vehicles. Sometimes they are nervous of vehicles, and sometimes they are very comfortable being around vehicles. It just depends on their experience and how defensive they're feeling. And in fact, these young bulls are often the best with vehicles. They're the ones that tend to react the least to vehicles. They're the ones that have the most confidence because they're the most curious. 
It's the cows that are defensive with their calves that are the absolute, uh, or the ones you've got to be the most careful of. And sitting underneath a dead knob thorn tree killed by another Hello, elephant. Ah, oh, there we go. Hello, That's better. Okay. Let's head 1,600 miles to the north to Taylor and Lions in the Masai Mara. Hello again, everybody. Oh, we're still just sitting with the Olololo Pride. And they seem to be waking up slightly now, which is quite good. I think, however, they're going to be moving towards the shade on this live safari. Where are you going? Don't go down into the lugger. Hmm. If she goes down into that lugger, we're going to be in a little bit of trouble, aren't we? Hey, no, all those shrubs. Don't hide away. Manu, what do you think? What do you think she's going to go and stalk? those animals on the other side. I don't know if she looks like she's going to be stalking. Sleep. Sleeping lions. Wonderful. That's a great start. Thank you so much, lions. <laughs> oh, cats. At least the little ones are still out. But I don't know if they're going to stay out for too long. I can't believe they're not playing around. It's bizarre. Normally... Once the adults get up, you know, they start to play about. And it's cool and it's the morning still. They can't be having their siestas now. Or maybe they're exhausted after playing with that warthog skull yesterday. That was quite funny, hey Manu? Warthog skull came out of absolutely nowhere. Now, we are going to be going back in to TV. So just now I'm going to sit very quietly so that I can compose myself and act professionally. <laughs> Are you ready to be professional, Manu? Right, for the next 15 seconds, I'm just going to sit very quietly now. But you can enjoy the lions. Welcome back to your live safari here in the Masai Mara National Reserve where one of the lionesses has got up and left those two young cubs we've been watching all morning all by themselves. But don't worry, they're fine, they're safe, the adults are nearby and I was really hoping that they were going to jump up and start moving around. And for those of you who have just hopped on board, uh, welcome to you. Um, it's great to hear from you. Remember you can hashtag safari live if you'd like to have some a chats with us today but my name is Taylor McCurdy and it is great to meet all of you and I look forward to hearing uh, from you from all of your questions and it'll be really really exciting perhaps this is your first time seeing a little lion cubs or maybe you've been on many safaris before count yourself very 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 lucky now we've got many other people out on safari with us this morning not just here in the Masai Mara but also down in South Africa in the Sabi sand now Sharon you've said to me can I spell the Ololo pride for you of course I can but you know what I have to do Sharon I have to write it down first because Otherwise, if there's too many O's and L's, then I'm going to trip over my tongue. So, O L O L double O L O. <laughs> Did you get that, Sharon? <laughs> One more time. O L O L double O L O. And, Sharon, you can let me know if you'd like me to. Uh, write it down for you so you can have a look absolutely no problem I shall do that but just send through another question and remember to use that hashtag because we are live oh, these lionesses seem to be edging closer and closer towards the drainage line I think hoping to look for a summer shade to rest up for most of the day it seems as though Tristan's cat down in the sabi sand miles and miles away has not decided to give up on her patrol 
Well, we haven't given up and we've managed to find her again. She's just come out of a really dense thicket and a bit of perseverance has helped. But the really good thing is that she's hunting some warthogs at the moment. So there's some warthogs that are off in the distance that we came across before we spotted her. We were busy looking at the warthogs and we thought we'll try and see if maybe she's watching these same warthogs. And it seems as though she's heading straight towards them. So I'm going to turn around quickly so that we can just keep up with her before we decide that she's going to... To go away and, and lose us once again but it's so exciting we're on the hunt with this leopard and it is the best thing in the whole world to be on a hunt with a female leopard she often is very calculating it's a very different type of hunting to things like lions that use each other leopards are calculating and will spend time to negotiate their terrain and try and get in as close as they can now the problem is is I don't want to disturb her hunt so we're gonna try and give a little bit of area to her and a little bit of space and leave her to kind of slowly stalk in. What I want to do though is position myself in a way that we can see both the warthogs and the leopard. There the warthogs are. Do you see them? They're just in front of us. So she's getting closer and closer towards where the warthog family is and she's going to be looking for those smaller warthogs. Look, you see how she's going slowly? She spotted them. She knows that they're here. So from here we're going to try and keep our voices down. We don't want to ruin the hunt for her. Those warthogs have no idea that this leopard is here. They are a bit concerned because they can see us, but they don't know that the leopard is there. And so if we sit still now, those warthogs hopefully will start feeding again and will stop worrying about us. But she's going to slowly but surely stalk her away. And what she's doing now is just stopping and looking and listening and just trying to work out which is the best way for her to approach these warthogs. At the end of the day, the warthogs are going to move and she's going to think about a way to try and get around them so that she can ambush them. Leopards are not like cheetah that they're able to run at incredible speeds or like lions as I mentioned just now where they've got each other to rely on. She She's got a situation where she's got to try and stalk and ambush this prey and so what she does is she calculates where she's going to go and then she moves towards those warthogs now jared's buddy you're wondering why do you or why do leopards never hunt in parlor nurseries well they do in fact in this particular area not there's not just the warthogs there is also impalas with tiny babies as well and so you're gonna have a situation where she if she doesn't get right with the warthogs she might turn her attention to those impalas and those impala babies the thing about impalas though is that there is a lot more eyes and ears and noses and so it's a lot harder to get closer to those when they're in those big herds it's much easier to get to things like warthogs which are in small groupings together they're also much lower to the ground and the chances of seeing her is a lot more difficult but you can see that warthog thinks there's something going on it's seen our vehicle and so it's a little bit kind of nervous as to what's happening and she'll be trying to protect her little piglets and make sure that she keeps them safe and what Tundi is doing is just trying to slowly edge her way using the cover of all of these bushes and you can see the camouflage how well it works for both these animals both of them at the end of the day are actually quite well camouflaged considering so we're just going to have to sit and be really patient as she tries to get a little bit closer and while we sit and be patient we're going to send you all the way thousands of miles northeast to Jamie who's got massive pachyderms that are going down to a little bit of water. Patience is a fantastic thing out here and we've been patient as well. We've been looking for lions all morning but we're here in the Maasai Mara and we've parked ourselves in exactly the right place to have a look at these elephants who are going to walk right past us. Now my name is Jamie and as I said we're in the Maasai Mara of Kenya and it's fantastic that you've had such wonderful experiences with both leopards and lions but of course we do want to show you although big cat is coming up next week we do want to show you some of the other creatures that live in the same place as the big cats you've already had that amazing experience with James and his elephants we already had that amazing experience Now, unfortunately, there's a few technical difficulties, and that's part of being on a live safari, is that we're out in the middle of the bush, but our Tundi is still sitting patiently and still waiting. The warthogs are in the background. They haven't moved too far either, and so it's still a bit of a stalemate at this stage, but I'm sure what she's doing is just working out which way are these warthogs going to go. Are they going to go right? Are they going to go left? But you can see the warthog's head is now dropped down, so they're starting to feed again, which means that they're comfortable, that nothing is around, and that's what she wants. She wants them to put their heads down 
down and start to feed because that means that they're not paying attention they're not looking they're not listening and at the end of the day they're also going to be eating food which creates a bit of noise and that will allow her to stalk her way closer and she's got a really good line to where these warthogs are she's got a nice little thicket that curves round to those warthogs and she'll try and use that thicket to the best of her advantage you can see there is a lot of trees between where she is and those warthogs so this is an ideal place for a leopard to be hunting and because she's got a little cub she needs to be hunting quite excessively to try and provide enough nutrients now I, like I say, I'm going to sit patiently and it seems that Noel has traded places with Jamie and the two of them are sharing the elephants this morning. I am, I am, I've traded tra places with Jamie and we... Uh, that's just there by its mum and that is the size of an elephant that lions would try and go for but also hyenas if a clan of spotted hyenas is big enough now that being said i've also watched two male lions take out sends if we can go to that one that's at 12 o'clock and we all see that one there that one is about five, six years old. I've watched two male lions take down an elephant that size. So when it comes to lion interaction with a large prey species like an elephant, it's one, it's, it's hard for some humans, a lot of humans to watch it because we all connect very closely with elephants. But then two, they have to know what they're doing. They have to specialize in doing it. I also used to work with two male lions. There's another little one coming out um, just on our other side. It will slowly be able to come through. Oh, excellent. I've also worked with two male lions who could take out full-grown black rhino as well, which is which is a very large... Sorry, guys, we've got um, some electric poles in the way here, so please excuse that. So when they... When they specialize with these sorts of large prey species, they really know what they're doing. Now, while I'm busy here trying to figure out how to show you these elephants without poles in the way, let's go over to James, who's pretending to be a leopard, I think? Well, yes, one of a leopard's greatest abilities is the ability to remain camouflaged, often up in trees like this. And it gives them the unique chance to put their kills into trees and stash them away from thieving predators like lions and like hyenas, of course. Lions can climb, but not nearly as well as their leopard cousins can. And it has been my sort of bucket list wish, if you like, to see a black panther sitting up in a tree one day in other words a melanistic black leopard it would be very special indeed so that's what I'm doing up here I am demonstrating how astonishingly well camouflaged I am in the tree and imagine something the color of a leopard Hosanna, Tandi, Tingana, take your pick hanging out in a tree like this they'd be almost invisible and so that's why I'm up here now Tandi is hopefully going to catch her warthog and take it into a tree, I'm going to have a catnap. Well, let's hope so. She's gotten much, much closer. She's still not in full stalk mode, though. She's edged her way quite a lot closer to where we last saw the warthogs, and now she's just sitting and watching. I have a funny feeling that the warthogs have moved slightly from where we last saw them because the way that she walked up was quite confident and quite brazen. Generally, when a leopard is getting close to its prey animal, you'll find it'll get down nice and low, its stomach almost to the ground, and those shoulder joints that float will get up, and they'll be able to then crawl their way on their belly towards their prey animal so I think what's happened is she's just closing the distance again the, the warthogs maybe have increased distance slightly she's now closing that distance once again and is trying to then get closer and closer and what she's going to do is she's going to get to a situation where she's going to try and keep his, and get to sort of five meters or so out so not very far going to then launch an attack but I don't think we're quite at that point just yet I think we're in a situation where she's got to get close the distance quite a lot more than where she is at the moment and so while we sit with her and wait for her to close that distance and get her to stalk a little bit closer let's go to across to my friend Jamie all the way in Kenya northeast Africa with her elephants <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to giggle. This young male elephant is giving us such a fantastic show. I think he's about to spray water on me, I'm not sure. The animals of the Maasai Mara and of course of South Africa are absolutely incredible. And this is 100% live. Listen to the sound effects of this elephant drinking. He's slurping up the last little bit of milkshake. 
Hey, mister. <laughs> He's been... Ay, 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 ay. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Don't be cheeky. Don't be cheeky. Yes, I'm watching you drink. It's very, very cool. Yes, mister. I know. I know. See, we're just sitting still. You came to me. Not the other way around. There's just a young male testing out his boundaries and my boundaries. I didn't approach him, he approached me. So now he's got to learn. Yes. Yes, I know. Yes, you're very scary, very scary. Okay, now to try and come round behind me. Now, I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. Hey. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. <laughs> you can't see it, unfortunately, but he's right behind us basically just showing us how big and scary he is and in a situation like this all we really want to do I see you all we really want to do is make sure that he doesn't make this into a game so if he learns that we're going to race away every time he does this when he gets to the point of being big and scary then it really is going to be very big and scary but at the moment it's just a young teenage bull trying to act a little bit too big for his boots. Remember, 100% live, hashtag Safari Live is how you get hold of us. He's moved away, which means I can start the vehicle. <laughs> Silly boy. He sprayed water at us at one point. Yes, we're talking about you. Yes, this is a big trumpet. Big trumpet. Okay, as we wait for our elephants to wander off, off you go all the way back across to South Africa where Tristan has got... We do indeed, and look at the incredible camouflage of this cat. You can see how those spots just help it blend into its environment. It's still watching the warthog, so it hasn't quite gotten into full stalk mode just yet. Still watching and calculating and working it out. And I was saying just now that leopards will be really patient when it comes to hunting. They don't just rush in and grab their food item. They'll take some time to actually settle and to really try and calculate exactly where they need to be. And you'll find a situation where they're going to try and get as close as possible and then launch this incredible attack and you'll find that with her she's just playing the patience game it's better for her to be patient and to try and to work out where she's actually going to be and where she's going to position herself but I would like to hear from all of you in a one-word tweet how a leopard hunting makes you feel for me it's sheer exhilaration I absolutely love watching leopards on the hunt I love the way that they calculate and that they stalk and that they move around Around. and so I would love to hear from you how this leopard hunt makes you feel and and so hopefully she is going to go into that stalk mode again it is my favorite thing to watch I absolutely love when leopards get low down and they stalk on their tummies there's just something about it it's this sort of it almost invokes a bit of kind of fear in me the way that they just get down and how they can disappear in even the shortest of grass so the grass here is not very long but if this leopard gets completely down and low it's going to creep through the other interesting thing is that I've heard a few guinea fowl now in the background there's a guinea fowl that are making a little bit of alarm call you see how she's turned her head now to look so I wonder if maybe something else is lurking in this particular area now Chris you're wondering which animal kills a prey or which cat kills prey faster so lion or leopard well it depends on the size of the animal at the end of the day but generally leopards tend to kill their prey animals a lot faster they get it over the muzzle or over the throat and they'll try and strangle and, and suffocate that animal whereas lions sometimes particularly things like buffalo when they hunt those they'll just start feeding on that buffalo even before it's dead and the buffalo can sometimes live for over an hour it's a very cruel process but it is the way that it goes and because the buffalo is so large those lions really struggle to be able to get onto it and, and to really subdue it and they want to stay away from those horns whereas Whereas with the leopards, they try and get onto their throat and silence that animal as soon as possible because they don't want to attract too much attention to themselves. Now, Nikki, you say primal for the one word tweet. I quite like that. The way that they stalk and the way that they move in is a very primal instinct and it is instinct at the end of the day. You'll find that these cats, while they do calculate the initial phases as the hunt unfolds, so that instinct takes over and that primal sort of notion comes in. Now, 
Linda, you say suspenseful. It is suspenseful, isn't it? You can almost cut the tension with a knife. You can see that Warthog is not far from where she is. She's just sitting and watching at the moment, and she's trying to work out how she's going to close that gap a little bit. But the fact that we can see both of them not too far from one, of an, one another means that she's actually not... Well, she's getting quite close now. So this is starting to get really exciting, and we're starting to see a situation where she's getting much, much, much closer. And I think what she's doing is she's sitting patiently waiting for these warthogs to start coming past that bush and into a clear line of sight and that's when she's going to go low and hopefully launch that attack it's really going to be very exciting now we're going to go into a short little break because at the end of the day we're going to just try and catch our breaths but this leopard is slowly stalking so don't go anywhere i'm sure she's going to get closer and hopefully when you rejoin us she'll be right on the tails of those warthogs Sorry, cursed. Now, I apologize for that. We were just into our ad break and I forgot actually to say this is Safari Live, which is very naughty of me. I'm sure Kirst is going to slap me on the wrist a little bit later, but that's okay. We'll try and remember a little bit later. I just get too excited about leopards, as you all know. And so I'm in a situation where I'm trying to kind of calm my sort of excitement at this point it's it's really watching tundi go about business and it's been a long time since i've watched a leopard hunt and watched her go about her business and i've been talking about it with a number of the guides this week is that we seem to struggle to find tundi on kills even though she's got this cub on juma lately we even we haven't seen her on a meal for quite some time and so I really hope that we will be able to sort it out. Now, while we sit and wait for Tandy to get a little bit closer, I believe Noel has found a very rare, very endangered predator to show all of you. Hello, hello, the wild dogs are back, they're back. When we were sitting with our elephants earlier, I could hear them calling. Um, and so this is very exciting. They've managed to come over onto our side. Here they are, here they are. I'm just gonna stop here so that Senzo can focus in properly. They've been hunting, they've been moving all morning just on our southern boundary, just where we couldn't really see them. And now they've managed to pop up. I promise you they're here, they're coming towards the dam. Look at them moving. As you guys know, this is my favorite. So two leopards this morning, plus baby elephants, Plus wild dog, I am over the moon. I hope all of you are over the moon as well. I'm also super chuffed about uh, uh, Tristan's sighting with Tundi because that is too, too, too special. He's been looking for Tundi for so long and we've been hoping for a really great update. And now that she's stalking and hunting, it's just incredible. So now these dogs are definitely on the hunt. We are going to, well, I'm definitely going to stay with them as long as possible, but it's going to be interesting to see who makes the kill first, the wild dogs or Tundi? Now Tundi has to move really slowly and really, really carefully and the dogs just run and they, they scatter and they, remember we talked about this morning, here they come and now I have vehicles with me, do you have to share this sighting? There we are, beautiful, absolutely stunning. Look at those coats unique you can already see how unique they are different to everyone the one coming up from behind is very dark and this is only three remember this pack is about 12 or 14 in number they've just gone behind the bushes a little bit there all right i think we're going to try and and move around and we're definitely going to do our best to follow them as much as we possibly can there's usually a lot of impala in this area as well as water buck so let's head on over to tristan and see how far tandy's gotten and then we will we will see who gets it first tandy or the wild dog well at this stage i don't know if tandy's going to be doing anything because she's now laid down and decided to sit and rest for a little bit so she's not really in too much of a hurry and she's not really seems to be too interested in these warthogs even though the warthogs are not far they're just on the other side of that little thicket she seems to have kind of stopped for now and maybe that's her plan is just to sit tight and hope that the warthogs will slowly drift closer towards her and come around that bush and she can then surprise them from there she's kind of glancing over at them but you can see she's not really that interested 
at this point. Although that warthog is seriously getting close and you can see the warthog is just feeding and it's got its head down every now and then and so the situation is that it is quite close. I suppose that hunt could play out very very quickly here if it does go the right way. Now I'm just going to hold off speaking because we are going to come out of an ad break. Welcome back to this live safari for Big Cat Week. You can see our leopard is sitting still patiently, still waiting, hoping that the warthogs come closer. My name is Tristan, and like I say, we are watching a live, live leopard hunt. This leopard is just sitting at the moment, just waiting patiently, and just trying to see if these warthogs can then come a little bit closer. At the end of the day, she has a situation where the warthogs are just behind the bush and they are moving around. They're going from one side to another. They're trying to kind of go around and then feed and, and I'm pretty sure at some point that warthog is going to come around and that's what Tundi is waiting for. She wants that warthog just to skirt the fringes of that tree and then she can use her speed to try and tackle it. But while we sit patiently and wait, we're going to send you across to uh, Jamie, I believe, who's got some buffalo bulls in the Masai Mara, thousands of miles north of us. You're back live with us now. You've come from the Sabi Sand in South Africa all the way to the Masai Mara National Reserve where we've got some animals that the lions might find uh, to be suited for their menu, except they can be a bit of a problem for a lioness. And uh, with their size up here, it can be a little bit on the tricky side to take them down sometimes. Now, you can see that there are some white birds following, of course, uh, those uh, buffalo. But I will tell you about them in a little bit because they're quite funny to watch. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and uh, it's great to have you on board live with us. So remember to uh, keep uh, chatting to us, to keep asking us questions. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter to ask us absolutely anything you've ever dreamed of asking a safari guy. Now, these white birds are called cattle egrets, and they're quite brave moving uh, below the feet of the buffalo because they most certainly certainly wouldn't be doing that with a pride of lions. Those young cubs would chase after them and actually find them quite entertaining. Now you can see as they move, those birds race towards the buffalo's feet and that's because they're disturbing insects as they're moving through the grass. And with all of the rain that we have had over the past few weeks, the insects are plentiful. So it's an amazing symbiotic relationship between the buffalo and the cattle egrets. And it happens with a number of different species out here. With lions, there's not too many birds that are brave enough to go down to them, but there is a lizard that will sometimes feast upon uh, the flies uh, that lurk around the lions. That's quite amazing uh, to see. A typical death stare of an African buffalo looking straight towards us. He's an older boy too. A very, very dangerous animal to come across while on foot. Now, James is still in the Sabi Sand at Chitwa, Chitwa Dam, where the bird life is plentiful, just like here in the Mara. I think he's managed to spot one that likes to catch the fish. I do. I have a bird that likes to catch fish. A tremendously cryptic link there from Taylor McCurdy all the way up in the Masai Mara. It is a fish eagle most closely related of course to the American bald eagle. Very distantly related to lions and leopards. Uh, well probably uh, even more distantly than you or I are. And even more distantly than the thing I'm going to show you now in the microscope. the burrowing lion, of an ant lion that is its front end you can see rather nasty pincers if you were an ant you wouldn't like to be grabbed by those things and what it's doing is disguising itself in amongst the stones here it's become almost completely invisible more so than a lion amongst the tawny grasses of the Masai Mara and it is going to eat ants under the ground for at least a year of its life 
and the worst part of that ordeal for this poor hapless creature is that it is unable to relieve itself for a year. Imagine having constipation for a year, that is how it would be for you. Then it turns into this. And its first act after turning into this, of course, is to deposit a fairly substantial white pellet onto the ground, the accumulation of a year's worth of ant eating. Marvellous, isn't that wonderful? That is the ant lion from Lions. We're going to go across to Dags. Okay, we've got the wild dogs again. They started chasing what we thought was Niala, um, but we, we couldn't really see, and they obviously haven't gotten it. I still am with the other two vehicles in the sighting, and it's funny enough that Tax and his guests are the same guests that we keep seeing every single time with these wild dogs. So I'm trying my best to keep sighting you. Here we go. I'll stop so Senzo can get a little bit of a view for you. Absolutely, absolutely incredible. Just check them here, everybody. They're just on the on the corner on the corner, on the side of the tree line there. And I'm convinced that these dogs are going to make a kill before Tanya does, I am. I'm gonna place, place, uh, place money on it, for sure. I'm gonna just move forward a little. They've seen something. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just gonna move forward just a little bit. Sorry, everyone. Here we go, this is gonna be really nice. Oh, there you go, Sens, you can work your beautiful magic. So I didn't get a chance to introduce Senzo earlier, but Senzo's my cameraman today. He's been my cameraman for the past few days. Um, of course, now they're going to go back through into the Milwaukee. Remember, they don't move like cats, hey? They don't move like Tandi. They're not as precise as her. They're up and down and zigging and zagging, and they're not quite sure what they want to do and where they want to go. But it, it works very well, this hunting style. All right, guys, we got to make a move. We got to make a very big move if we're going to keep up with them. There they run, there they run, they're going towards Twin Dams. I'm gonna do my best. Let's go over to Tristan with Tani and see how she's getting along with her hunt and we'll keep you updated from this side. Well, you can see by the twitching of the tail that she's now locked on again. And so she's realized that the warthogs are maybe a little closer than she first thought. So she's up and she's going and the warthogs are slowly coming around the bush. I just saw the back of a warthog slowly coming around through a gap just now. And what I'm hoping is that they're just going to come around the edge of that green thicket and she can then explode with that incredible speed off the mark. So it's getting quite exciting now. She's getting a lot, lot closer and the warthogs are falling into the trap by moving straight straight towards her. She's not having to move a muscle at this stage. She's just sitting attentively and watching them. And it's interesting because I've had the most amazing experiences with Tandy and Warthogs. She seems for some reason to take enjoyment in stalking them and sometimes she doesn't always catch them like there is for a while she's went after a big male warthog the one time and she kind of snort. you see how she's getting a little lower except that the Warthogs are really close to where she is I don't know what she's doing Surely she's going to show herself. The warthogs are just on the other side of that thicket that she's gone into. Just through that gap is the last time I saw a warthog. But she's being very brazen about the way that she's going about things. I'm going to try and just reposition ourselves just a little bit because we can't see very much from there. So, although there she comes out. Now, where's the warthog? Now, I'm not sure where the warthogs have gone. They were right there where she's walked. It seems as though they've drifted off. She's not really interested, so I don't think she's going to carry on on this hunt. You can see the tail is up and curled, so she's displaying that she's not going to be hunting anymore. And so while we follow her and see where she goes next, let's go back across to Jamie in the Masai Mara as she starts, well, tries to negotiate her way through the Great Plains of Africa. Ah, oh, Tundi. So while Tundi musters up some uh, sort of anticipation for breakfast, I know that it's a big cat week coming up, and we've got the aerial equivalent of the lion. So the lion is the biggest big cat in Africa. We have got the biggest raptor in Africa. 
the Marshall Eagle, and in this case it is a juvenile Marshall Eagle. But to give you some sort of perspective as to the size of these magnificent birds, and it's a bird that you could see both here in the Maasai Mara and of course all the way back to where the crew in South Africa are showing you the amazing things. Their wingspan is over two meters, so over six feet in size. I'm not sure what this particular specimen is after. It's hopping around looking for something to feed on. So a juvenile martial eagle the biggest eagle that we get out here just in terms of sheer bulk. I was saying that to give you a perspective as to just how big these eagles actually are, that eagle is capable of taking on a small antelope. So we've seen them hunt a small impala, we have seen them hunt a type of antelope called Thompson's gazelle. They are exceptionally powerful birds and rather than using speed and agility what they'll do is they'll spot their prey and then shoot down from the skies and use pure bulk to grab and crush the prey that they're after. Now, our Lara Moore, you say that it is so white. It is indeed, and that's because it is a juvenile. They do take a few years to get the proper full brown coloring of the adult martial eagles, although they'll keep a little bit of the white chest and with brown flecks around it. They are extraordinary. So, we're looking at one of the biggest birds of prey out here. Let's head back across to Taylor, who's not far from me now, who has one of the more endangered ones. Well, we aren't too far away from you, and you're quite right, Jamie. We've got one of Africa's most endangered birds, and it's an incredible sighting. And I'll tell you why. It's because that bird that's just coming through with the yellow facial skin is a juvenile. It's not an adult just yet. And just like lions will teach their youngsters to hunt and look for food, that's exactly what's going on right now. Is these adult birds live in a family group. They're cooperative breeders, so it'll just be one dog dominant pair and the others will help raise this chick and it takes them a number of years so it's pretty incredible the way and try and flush out prey they've got a very very powerful beak which they will use to probe between, between bark and they will dig with their beaks as well tip over elephant dung looking for grubs looking for chameleons snakes mice and rats they really are ferocious predators and eat a variety of different things now this is live from the Masai Mara National Reserve you were just with Jamie who also had a beautiful a uh, big raptor and uh, Brent is out and about and he's got some lines a little bit further down towards the Mara River. And uh, If you have got any questions for us, hashtag Safari Live. That is the way to get hold of us on Twitter. Now, they seem to be quite interested at the base of this tree, so I wonder what's hiding underneath the grass. I wonder what we can't see. And sometimes when they hammer down with their beaks, it's pretty incredible to hear that. Now, Mac, you've said that you love the sound that the birds, uh, that these birds make. Oh, most certainly. It's absolutely incredible. And you normally hear it first thing in the morning. I actually did hear it calling uh, from my tent this morning. It is beautiful. Um, and not only do they have a beautiful voice, I think they're quite attractive birds, especially when they fly. They've got lots and lots of white and their wings, which you can see every now and then. Now you can see that youngster is going up to the adults looking for reassurance, trying to figure out if anybody has found it a snack, as I don't think it is as uh, good at hunting as the adults are, much like those little lion cubs of the Olololo pride. So you've already met Steph, who is miles and miles away in the Asabi Sand, the northeastern corner of South Africa. He's avoiding the buffalo in the bigger game, but it seems as though he's found something small. We have found something small right here on this grass blade and it's part of the allure of being out in the bush is that you just don't know what to expect around the next corner. It could be a lion, could be a leopard, could be a cheetah or it could be these insects which I'm going to explain in a second. For those of you who are joining us later on in the show, my name is Steph Vinterboer and we are on foot out here in the middle of the Kruger National Park and a real, real privilege it is to be out here as well. What these are... You can see the egg cases right here, 
This is these little guys are babies and they are voracious predators. They've just hatched. They were clinging to each other at the top of this grass stalk. When you walk past, a lot of them bungeed off of a silken thread onto the floor. And I'm going to see if I can pick one up here and show you one a little bit closer. But these are the larvae of an owl moth. Now, owl moths are fantastically beautiful, net-winged, nocturnal insects. But their, their babies are these absolute lions of the insect world they walk around with a pair of teeth on them that would rival elephant tusks if they were that big excuse me not an owl moth an owl fly you are 100 percent right in that uh i was just corrected by Kirsty. <laughs> the uh owl moth owl fly excuse me there we go there's the little larvae there and you can see those pincers on the front of it on the front of its body those two teeth there and what they basically do is ambush ants when they are young like this they'll ambush ants and if you come and have a look here the mo the mother has very carefully in my opinion managed to place this her eggs right close to an ant colony there's not too many right here but there's a lot of ants at the back here all part of the same colony i think that was by design she placed her babies here, they would be very close to the best food source and from there on they'd then pupate and come out at this fantastically beautiful. Now Snazzy, you'd like to know if these are poisonous? They're not poisonous Snazzy that I know of to be, to be honest with you. To be, to be fair, I've only seen these once before in my life. They are fairly rare insect to see mainly because they're nocturnal and during the middle of the day they hide out in thick forests on the bark of trees this is the adults that i'm talking about now these youngsters will very quickly move off and as you can see from their delicate nature here that once they start to go into their ambush positions we won't see them again until they pupate and they come out isn't that fantastic real treat to see in actual fact and the fact that they're holding on with silk was a surprise to me. I didn't realize that they actually produced silk. So, all in all, quite an interesting insect with this, uh, with this life cycle that it has. Now, we are on a game path here. We're still looking for that leopard pair that were mating last night. So, just a bit of background and a bit of context. Last night, we got a report that two leopard were mating. This morning when we woke up, there was... a uh, um, there was a report on our dam cameras of a leopard on the dam wall and we are in the area where that where that was to look for those leopard and walking around on these game paths is the best way of finding tracks and uh, that's what we've been doing the whole morning so far unlucky i must be honest with you we haven't managed to find anything but someone that is very lucky is tristan who's sitting with tandy why don't we go see what she's up to Well, I do consider myself very lucky, Steph. At the end of the day, any time you can lay eyes on this elusive animal is a good day. And so I feel incredibly privileged to be able to follow this animal and to bring all of you along with us on a live safari for Big Cat Week. Now, it is incredible to watch her going at the moment. You can see her tail is up and it is moving quite a bit and you see that white piece of the tail. Earlier when she was hunting that tail was down so she was trying to keep it down because it's easy for other animals to see it but now she's walking with it up as almost if to say to everybody I'm not hunting anymore which might be good news for us because it might be meaning she's on her way now towards the den. Now Julia you're wondering how far a leopard would travel away from her cub. Well we know roughly where the den is at the moment she might have of course moved the den in the last few days but we know roughly where the den is and that den from where we are now is probably I would say less than a mile away so it's not too far so she'll try not to go too far away but at the end of the day she also needs to find food and that means that she's got to move quite a bit to find that food now I'm trying to keep up with her as she negotiates these very dense riverine areas because this is the places that leopards love to move around in you can see it's thick, it's brushy, it's not easy at all. And so while I try
try and keep up with her and, and try and follow her as much as we can because I think she might be going to the den. Let's go back across to Jamie Patterson with those beautiful big Ellie's in the Maasai Mara. It's a tough job keeping up with animals in South Africa, an entirely different ecosystem <clears throat> to the one that we're experiencing here, half a continent away in the Maasai Mara. Remember, this is completely 100% live and we are sitting with uh, some more elephants. Um, in this case, a cheeky young male who's just gone wandering across in front of us. Uh, just a quick reintroduction. My name is Jamie and as I said, we are in Kenya and we've got this amazing scene in front of us. Just look at these little baby elephants dashing about. It is too sweet. Oh, everyone, of course, always says that lion cubs are the most playful baby animals. But I have to say, elephants are a very strong contender. And this little group are simply trouble. Oh, we're going to be taking a short break very soon. But don't go anywhere. There's so much happening. Tundi hunting, wild dogs, and the joys of the Maasai Mara. There's just too much for you to miss. This is Safari Live. And we are in our internet break, which of course is actually how we're all watching it. And these elephants are being so thoroughly entertaining this morning. They really are. I gave them a little bit of extra room because it's the same herd that were, walked past me earlier. And I don't want to encourage that young bull and his nonsense. Although he did come running towards me. Totally broke the line that the herd was walking down. Um, Sean... It's an interesting one. You want to know how the, the cows toss the bulls out when they are when they're at, at the point of sort of hitting sexual maturity and it's time for them to leave. A combination of pushing them, physically pushing them to the outskirts of the herd and at the same time um, essentially just isolating them, keeping them away from the rest of the herd and from the little ones. And we've seen what happens when young bulls break that rule. The females can get very aggressive and occasionally physical. But at the same time, it's also an instinct within the young males. And I always feel a bit sorry for them because I don't think they always understand exactly what's going on and they've still got that social instinct. But they do also know instinctively it's time for them to move off. Okay, well, as our elephants go wandering off, let's send you back all the way across to South Africa to join James, who's got some residents of the waterhole. We do. We have got a heron, a green-backed heron, that is eating a weaver. It looks like the, either the fledgling or even an adult weaver that it's clearly pulled out of a nest or uh, no it's probably fallen out of the nest but I thought originally that it was perhaps a fish or a frog but there you can see it's a weaver isn't that amazing that really is very special I've never seen that before we came around here to look at our baby hippo who's not far from here but we were then arrested, of course, by the sight of that green-backed heron and its murderous ways, trying to swallow it. You see that? Not understanding why the wings and shoulders won't go down its gullet quite as easily as the slippery scales of a feech. Oh, it's gone. Almost. Imagine having that stuck in your throat. Uh, that heron is going to need a Heimlich manoeuvre fairly soon. Ugh, I feel nauseous looking at it. I feel short of breath. I would also be astounded if it's able to digest the feathers. The whole bang shoot. A little bit like eating an entire chicken with the feathers, the feet, the beak. Ah. Vom. No teeth, you see. 
What's the trouble with being a bird? No teeth. And the heron, of course, doesn't even have the little toothed bull. Cheryl, yes, absolutely, it is a first for me. You say, is it a first to see? F you say it's a first to see for you. It's definitely a first to see for me. I've never seen anything like that. I think that heron's going to give up. I can't believe it's going to manage to get that thing down its throat. See, with a fish, what it would do is basically bash it until all of the bones were broken and the scales had come off. But remember, a fish bone, much smaller, less robust than a weaver's bones. And I mean, especially the shoulders there, obviously a bird's shoulders, a flying bird's shoulders, very substantial compared with those of a feech. So a little wood sandpiper getting closer. Furry bootle snoot, you say, table manners. Well, yes, exactly. Isn't it disgusting table manners being demonstrated here? Now, we've got 30 seconds till television. Let's see if this heron can eat before then. I hope not. Oh, don't swallow. 10 seconds, 10, heron. Oh. Welcome back to your live safari, everybody. There we have a green-backed heron, utterly unrelated in any way to a cat, eating a weaver bird. We've been watching it for the last few minutes. Here it comes. It's coming back out. It's coming back out now. And we think that it's caught the weaver bird either in its nest or perhaps it's a fledgling that's fallen. You still see it there, Ferg? Just some feet. Just some feet. Magnificent sighting there. So please do talk to us, continue to talk to us using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Be wonderful to have your questions or your comments. Lots of bird life here on the shores. What I wanted to show you when I came around here, however, was just over there, there is a hippopotamus with a little baby. And while it just looks like a few waves in the water now, you're going to see a tiny head pop up. Now, a tiny hippopotamus like that, there it is. <sighs> no bigger than a sort of fat goat or sheep, is very vulnerable to lions at night especially. And so that female hippo is extremely protective of the youngster. If I was to walk down towards the shore, she'd either disappear off into the middle of this water or she'd come roaring out. And so she'll have a tough time at night trying to keep that little thing away from the clasps and claws and teeth of these massive predators that we get in this area. Speaking of massive, well, I have a very large friend out in the wilderness at the moment, Scott Dyson, of course, built like a donus. The beard of Zeus has playing with some dung. Yes, we certainly are playing with dung. We're lying in and amongst an impala midden. And I just thought we'd show you a fun angle of Dave doing his business on camera. Now, what's interesting is that we've got two dung beetles on the scene. This is a very lazy individual, even though there's more than enough dung to go around. He's kind of walking around in circles and eventually heading back to the individual that's working hard at making his bolus. And this guy over there is trying to steal it. And it's so cool to see these dung beetles fighting over balls of dung. They're incredibly powerful animals and they can use their head to flick their opponents off as they try and steal their boluses of dung. Now, this guy's still got quite a bit of work to do. He's doing a good job though, using those front legs that are kind of spade-like in a way that they can build and mold these fresh piles of dung into a perfectly round ball. Now, I'm not too sure if this, is go this individual is going to bury the ball right here once he has worked it into the perfect shape, or if he's going to transport it away. It'll probably be a few more minutes, though, before he is finished. Oh, 
What's got his attention? Oh, he just wants to add another little dung pellet. Now watch that. Isn't this incredible how he works it? They are so, so powerful and he's making this dung look like butter. It certainly isn't. How cool is that? One or two flies popping into the scene. It's not just the dung beetles that get attracted to these fresh middens, but also the flies. And they all play their very important roles in breaking this dung down and getting it recycled back into the earth. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Now, we're probably going to keep moving on but I'm told a lot of you guys are loving these views so we can wait a little bit longer I'm hoping this guy decides to come back so we can see the hard-working individual toss him away he's had no problems and I'm wondering why this guy is so weak and so lazy you can kind of see he's not acting like a normal dung beetle usually they don't stop to take a breath but this guy clearly is Hello, Emre, are you saying how fun dung beetles are to watch? And they certainly are. You can watch them for hours because usually they're not like this lazy individual and they keep you highly, highly entertained as they go about their business. What's in interesting is that there's only these two that have come onto the scene. Oh, and this guy just tried to take off, but he just landed straight on his back. Ooh. There we go. Off he goes. Now, why is it that he's flying off now? Who knows what would have caused it to decide it was a good time to leave when there is some fresh dung here. Maybe he's going to go and try and pick on some other individuals and try and steal their dung. Very good. Well... Sounds like you guys have been having an epic morning with all the big cats, but not only the big cats, also with Noelle and her wild dogs, and it seems like she may have got another visual of them. Why don't you go and see? Hello, hello, Scotty D. Yes, it's been an epic morning, but I have not gotten another another sighting for you on camera with these wild dogs. They're moving like this, and then they're like this, and then they're like this, and then they're in the thick bush, and then they're... Oh, sorry, I don't want to fall into a hole. Hold on one second. And then they're running down the road, and then they change directions. It's been complete, complete anarchy. Um, so I'm just busy trying to find them again, and hopefully when I do find them, they have found their little Impala meal. We're going to head back towards Treehouse Dam side. I know we were at Twin Dam. And then we were far east of Twin Dams, and now we're over here by Treehouse Dam. It's it's absolute craziness. Now this is what it's like to be with wild dogs. This is exactly how they function. Papignano, you're curious to know if wild dogs are related to dingoes. That is a big, 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 big negative. Dingoes were once feral, feral dogs. Sorry, I can't talk. I'm too excited. So domesticated dogs that then became wild. African wild dogs have a common ancestor with wolves that relates back three million years ago. I actually think I need to start using their other name, which is African Painted Wolf, because I think sometimes the wild dog name is a little bit confusing. And they also look a lot like an Alsatian or a German Shepherd. Um, so no, no relation to dingoes. So three million years ago, common ancestor, and then wolves and wild dogs came off, and then off of wolves came domesticated dogs. It's a good question though, and it's one that, it's a question that we get often, that as well as are wild dogs related to domesticated dogs, but it's good to just reiterate everything so that we're all on the same page when it comes to scenarios like this because a lot of people have never heard of an African painted wolf. I've had guests before who have come here and they're so rare and they're so exciting and so enthralling and they've never heard of them and then you know you're racing around like a crazy person like I'm doing right now and everyone's going oh but they look like my German Shepherd but there's less than 3,500 left on the whole continent um, they are so 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 special. So I sent was just pointing out oh there's a drink stop happening up ahead we will go around that drink stop they, they got tired of chasing the wild dogs so this is the the group of, of guests that's been um, with us every every time we've been seeing the wild dogs in the past couple days and we've been taking uh, turns going through thick bush together and driving over stumps and it's been it's been crazy but the the sightings have been super good so now 
We are going to come around again. Let's head back towards Tristan with Tundi. I hope that she's managed to make our kill as we can find our wild dog. So let's head back to him. Well, Noelle, we're in a very similar boat to you. Tundi has managed to shake us and to disappear under our noses. I don't know how it's happened, but she kind of just went behind a bush and gone out the other side. We went round and she wasn't there. So we're trying to find her again. It's very undulating terra terrain, so not easy at all. But while we kind of keep looking and keep searching, I believe Taylor McCurdy and the Maasai Mara all the way north of us has managed to find something thing that Tundi would love to be hunting this morning. Tristan, I'm so sorry that Tundi has given you the slip, but those spotted cats are sneaky, but you're back live with us now in the Masai Mara National Reserve, where we're looking at one of the most successful antelope in Africa, the Impala. And this is a beautiful big Impala ram. Now, in South Africa, in the Sabi Sand, where Tristan is driving about, trying to find his spotted cat again, this is actually the favorite food of the leopards in the Sabi Sand. There are plenty of them around around uh, but many different big cats do a chase after them including the cheetah now for those of you who have just arrived and have just joined us on this live safari it's great to have you my name is taylor mccurdy and remember you can interact with us you can ask us questions all you have to do is hashtag safari live on twitter to have a chat with us now it's a bit dangerous out here for this impala ram uh, there are just uh, two of them and uh, this boy is leading the front though there's a much younger inexperienced ram behind him now, as we watch him move out into the open, he is scanning, making sure that there isn't any lions and leopards around. There was a question from Julia, and that is, how far distance do we travel on these live safaris? Well, Julia, it depends. Sometimes you can drive out of your camp, and on your doorstep are leopards and lions laying about. Other times you have to drive many, many miles in order to find something. But out here in the Masai Mara National Reserve, which is where we are live and uh, there seems to be plenty of animals about the lions were sleeping and disappeared out of view but i have a feeling that we could find some more now jamie's also in the mara driving about uh, she's looking for all sorts of creatures let's jump on board with her and see what she's got I have got a very strange creature, so we are indeed searching for all sorts of creatures and in this case we've come upon a herd of an antelope called a dopey and in my opinion probably one of the ugliest antelope that we see in the Maasai Mara. Not an antelope that you're going to see from our crew but because this is completely 100% live we do want to show you as much as we possibly can of the world of the big cats whether that's the big cats themselves or the animals that live around them. So a few weeks ago the great migration left the Maasai Mara. The wildebeest returned back towards Tanzania but one of the saving graces for the big cats was the birth of the little baby topi which of course when they are born are exceptionally vulnerable but the amazing thing about nature is because these little topi live in the world of big cats from the minute they take their first stumbling steps they are essentially capable of outrunning a big cat provided they get enough warning they are able to run as fast as they can and they're actually able to escape the claws of the cheetahs and the leopards and the lions there is an impala in the background as well but one thing that you will notice is just how different the color is let's have a look at the adult topi here the adult coloration and then the a little youngster off on the left that is much much lighter in color so also to help camouflage it away from the predators okay off we go across to brent who's also in the mara and he's enjoying some elephant sightings as well well look at that elephant she looks very alert like there is a possible big cat around but unfortunately for us she got a fright from a warthog that shot out of the grass near her feet now we've moved into an area quite different from where we were around the 
river earlier and we've been looking for another one of the big cats which is cheetah of course so unfortunately for us um, we haven't had any luck just yet as you can see the grass is quite long here so what i've been hoping to see is a cheetah sitting on top of a termite mound and uh, you never know what's going to happen when you're live so we could find a cheetah just by sitting here it might pop out of the long grass and uh, uh, as soon as those elephants started behaving like they were a little bit nervous there you go still still a little bit nervous after that war dog dashed off a proud cat mama is wondering do any tusks uh, start growing immediately after birth um, they have baby tusks that uh, they actually fall out so they have two sets of tusks so the, the little tushes of the baby elephant will fall out and, uh, and then their big teeth will grow later so yeah, I suppose the answer is yes and no but it's not the same set of tusks that they have throughout their life there you go you can see how tall the grass is getting that little Ellie is only half a little Ellie at the moment due to the long grasses in this part of the Mara, but it does equate for wonderful food for mom, so the babies can grow nice and big. There we go, look, the nose is up, smelling, 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 making sure there's no big cats around. So we're going to keep searching for the last few minutes. Hopefully, there's going to be a cheetah that pops out of nowhere. And while we do that, we're going to go all the way 1600 miraculous miles to james henry and some birdies well they are some birdies this time of course they are living birdies they are the same birdies that were being eaten by that green-backed heron a little bit earlier they are the village weavers and they are making their nests above the water so that predators struggle to get into their nests. Snakes predominantly, I suppose, with it being Big Cat Week very soon, we should talk about the possibility of leopards, lions or cheetahs climbing up into a weaver bird's nest. Now I suppose that it has perhaps happened over the course of evolutionary time, but I think you'll find it very rare. Uh, but have to be a fairly desperate cub trying to to climb into this tree and pull the little weavers out of their nests. I suppose leopard cubs may well do it in fact. Leopard cubs have one of the most Catholic diets of any creature out here. They'll eat lizards and birds and termites and terrapins and, well, maybe even the odd weaver before they move on to more delicious things like antelope and, well, that's all really. Uh, Mike, you want to know what their beaks are made of? Well, their beaks are made of bone and of keratin, a little bit like a horn. So they've got bone underneath and then there's a keratinous sheath over the top of it which sort of keeps it sharp and that gets replaced all the time. So keratin, but like your nails. And very similar to the horns of a an antelope oh yes indeed the claws of a cat for example made of keratin much like the nails of a human being or the claws of a cat precisely so that also there's another species further up the top there and that is the red-billed buffalo weaver and of course <laughs> buffalo the favorite prey of lions in many many parts of the world <laughs> But buffalo weavers, not quite, not quite so much. And they have the much bigger nests there. And in fact, they live in those nests all year round uh, as they avoid being eaten by the Inkahuma pride, which love buffalo very much indeed. Oh, Fergus, can you see the very edge of this island? There is a pygmy or malachite kingfisher in the mud. You can see on them there, just flying around the side. It's gone now. We won't see it again. How very sad. Never mind. Let's go back to the weaver on the far left hand side of this branch here and watch as he makes his nest for an unappreciative wife. If it is not to her satisfaction, of course, she will tear it to pieces. Now, Mara Safari Lion, you're wondering how they make these nests. Mara Safari Lion, they make them with the 
amazing genetic blueprint that they have in their brains or throughout their bodies actually. No one teaches a weaver how to do that. It grows up and suddenly knows how to weave that intricate shape with the tunnel for access and of course the little bowl in which the youngsters and the female will incubate the eggs. She lines it with feathers. How she knows to do that, no one knows. But basically what they do is they just weave the grass strands in between each other until they have created that basket. Now there is not a human being in the world that could sort of do that by default after birth. They'd have to be taught or they'd have to learn themselves. But a weaver just does it. That's just what they do. In the same way, I guess there's a, a lion, a leopard or a cheetah just knows that they need to hunt. Lions, of course, will hunt completely on instinct exactly the same way as this weaver builds its nest and in the same way that a leopard will hunt by instinct. Quite interestingly, however, a cheetah often needs to be taught how to hunt. They have the instinct, but a little bit like a human being which learns to talk. We have the instinct to talk, but we have to learn a language. That's a little bit like how a cheetah learns to hunt. We're just going to have one last scan around here. There is an Egyptian goose over there. Uh, not eaten by cats very much. They don't taste very good, apparently. All right, everybody, that's going to be it from us for this Big Cat Week rehearsal spectacular. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for giving us your questions and your comments. You're always a great help, and it's always wonderful to have you with us. We will see you for the actual Big Cat Week show, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, Nat Geo Wild on Friday.